I, I think, you know, personally, I think part of the reason we needed balance in the program is because it's impossible to predict where that next transformative result will come from. If history has taught us anything, it's sometimes those transformative results don't come yeah. where you're respecting. What's up, you scholars of enlightenment? I hope you had a wonderful holiday period and new year and have a brilliant first weekend of 2024 in store. In late 2023, the US particle physics community released its plan for the coming decade of research. It represents a mix of large, mid and small scale projects hosted at home and abroad and bolstered by a healthy dose of theory and ambitious R&D. The plan, created by the 30 members of the Particle Physics Project Prioritization Panel, or P5 panel, was approved by a federally appointed group of science advisors to the US agencies that fund research, the High Energy Physics Advisory Panel, or HEPAP. So is the future of US particle physics in robust health? And where do US-based physicists intend to focus their efforts? To help me answer those questions and many more, and understand exactly what the US intends to achieve in particle physics in the next 10 to 20 years, I'm joined by three brilliant special guests. Firstly, Professor Amanda Weinstein. Professor Weinstein is a particle physicist and high energy astrophysicist at Iowa State University. Professor Weinstein's work focuses on neutrino physics, including neutrinos from supernovae, as well as gamma rays from supernovae remnants, black holes, and other extremely high energy astrophysical events. Professor Weinstein was a panel member during the 2023 P5 process. I'm also joined by Professor Sarah Demers. Professor Demers is the Horace D. Taft Associate Professor of Physics at Yale University. As a particle physicist, she's interested in the fundamental particles of nature and the forces through which they interact and uses charged leptons, primarily taus and muons, to search for physics beyond the standard model. Professor Demers was also a panel member during the 2023 P5 process. Last but not least, I'm joined by Professor Patrick Mead. Professor Mead is a member of the C.N. Yang Institute for Theoretical Physics at Stony Brook University. His research interests are focused on physics beyond the standard model and include theoretical aspects of new physics, such as baryogenesis, collider physics, dark matter, flavor physics, and supersymmetry. He is also deeply involved in the push for future high-energy lepton colliders, including a potential muon collider. So I couldn't ask for three better special guests to help me dig into the 2023 P5 report. So, um, Sarah, maybe if I come to you first, um, for the people out there who aren't particularly au fait with the, uh, the P5 process, what is P5 and, and why is it so important for the future of particle physics, both in the United States and further afield? P5 is the Particle Physics Project Prioritization Panel. Yep. I worked very hard to get all of those yep. P's together. Uh, it turns out the field of particle physics has a lot of programs that require long-term planning. We have international collaborations. We have a really broad and diverse set of, of scientific questions that we're trying to answer. So we can't just go year to year and hope for the best that everything will work out and line up and use our resources well. Yeah. P5 is set up to make sure that we're good stewards of our resources, that we get community input, that we think really strategically about our longer term vision, taking into account scientific context, budgets and the international context. Is it, is it fair to say that it's kind of um, getting most bang for, for your buck with the, the funding that's available from from taxpayers money in the in the United States? Very fair to say, um, including thinking about what would we do more if we had a little bit more money? What would be the next thing that we would add? And if we have less money, what would we take away? It's it's really thinking about extracting maximum science and and, and um, yeah, yeah, within the, the profiles that we're given and up to get. And Amanda, maybe if I if I come to you next, what what does that that process look like in terms of the the kind of day-to-day -day creation of that report. I, I'm also interested in kind of how you get on that panel. I, I, I picture, you know, kind of uh, somebody tapping you on the shoulder in a 
in a dark room and saying, do you want to be on the P5 panel? How, how does that work? How do you get on the panel? And then how does the, the day-to-day production of that report proceed? So in terms of how we got on the panel, uh, there were no dark rooms involved. <laughs> it was a, Certainly on my part, it was electronic. Uh, I received an email asking me, if I was willing to serve. And I said, yes. And that was really all there was to it. I think the process of how people were chosen, I think I certainly don't have a ton of insight into in the sense, I believe there are nominations by the community Mm -hmm. and there are lists generated that the chairs of the panel and the chair of HEPAP uh, can look at and get some ideas of who they want to ask. But ultimately, the membership of the panel, uh, I believe, was up to the chair of HEPAP and the chair and the chair and deputy chair of the panel. Uh, I do think they they definitely looked for people who had a broad view of the field, Mm -hmm. and I think had in some cases had worked in more than one area Mm -hmm. of particle physics. Mm -hmm. I think that was considered a benefit when they constituted the panel, because ultimately those of us on the panel had to consider not just our own science and our own very personal interests, but the good of the field as a whole. So I think that was a factor. Excellent. And and what does it, what does that production of that report on a, on a day to day basis look like? So is, is this taking town halls, getting white papers from members of the community, kind of filtering down all the ideas that people have? What does, what does that look like? It's all of the above. I think there was a stage of the process that was very much a learning and fact finding and information gathering process for us. So we benefited from the SNOMAS process that came before us, which is a community planning process that takes place over two years in this case. Uh, It's usually more like one year, but this time around we had the pandemic involved and that extended the process quite a bit. And so two years of the community talking to each other, generating white papers, meeting in small groups, and then of course the final snow mass meeting that took place. And then all of that came to us as information. Once the panel membership had been solidified, the next stage was convening the town halls, which was an opportunity for the community to bring, to reiterate some of the priorities that they'd expressed in the snow mass process but also another opportunity for people who might not have had a chance to fully engage with that process uh, or had new ideas that had come about since SNOMAS to bring those to our attention as well. And there were four in-person town halls and two virtual ones that took place over a period of, must have been five months, Sarah, was that about right? It started in, we started setting up the town halls in January, and I think they ran from February through early June. And um, in the course of those town halls, we got a chance to meet with people from the community, listen to presentations, uh, talk to specific groups in some cases, in closed sessions as well, both people from the agencies and from the laboratories. And also from individuals, uh, other special groups such as early career scientists were invited to come talk to us and give us their perspectives um, in private to sort of reduce the stress (laughs) of bringing forward their concerns. So I think there was a variety of things that happened under the umbrella of the town hall to try to give us the broadest picture, possible picture of what was going on and what the interests were. Uh, And at that point, once those town halls were complete, we basically met with people until we really didn't have a lot more requests to meet. (laughs) Uh, We transitioned to an internal discussion process and we were meeting over the summer, I would say every few weeks in person to talk to each other, as well as meeting over Zoom and discussing things over Slack uh, to solidify our perspective on things. And it was really very much a process of talking until we achieved consensus. I think we were very blessed to have a very congenial panel. We enjoyed (laughs) talking to each other. I think we were very lucky there. And we really talked until we really were all on the same page. There was, 
when we say there was no voting and we just talked until we got to consensus, we're not snowing, you guys. That's really how it went. <laughs> that's really uh, that's really good to hear. So very much getting the input of the community, the priorities of the community, and then trying to to find a consensus of where to where to go from there. Um, Patrick, before we get into specific projects and funding streams that that, that show up in the in the P five suggestions maybe if i come to you as somebody who who wasn't on the panel how, how what what is your initial reaction patrick to the to the p5 report uh are you are you incredibly excited by it? i saw um today uh, i was looking at a blog the the particle bites i think 2700 community members from undergraduates to senior researchers have signed a petition to endorse um the p5 suggestions what's your reaction patrick yeah, I, I think the report was fantastic. I mean, I think this was such a long process where like snow mass was extra long. So we had like two plus years convening this and million meetings. And then it felt like with the town halls, we were kind of doing snow mass again and kind of like rehashing everything for another six months. And then the panel kind of disappeared behind the scenes, then came back. <laughs> and I, I think for the most part, everybody I've talked to is ecstatic about like, how well balanced the report came out. I mean, obviously things that I'm excited about were positively received by the panel um, and supported, but I, I think it's kind of looking compared to the last P5, compared to this P5, um, balance is the real thing that shows up this time. It's not just only a couple mega projects in certain yeah. directions. The whole health of the field was really well treated by this panel. So I. Thank you to, especially amongst the other panel members. It, it, it seemed like potentially, and you you guys will know far more about this from me stateside that that kind of projects like like June potentially kind of ate up a lot of the the oxygen in the room for the previous uh, P five. Is that fair, Patrick? Do you think there's a lot more well rounded kind of um, offering this time? I mean, I think last time, at least from what transpired with that particular report. Um, the budget scenarios, even though they're technically were, they had a more optimistic scenario than what this P5 was given in terms of a kind of a greenfield version of it. Um, there was also this mantra within the field that everything had to be under a billion dollars. The U.S. really wasn't looking for growth. And so that's why Dune was the thing that really kind of fit within the profile of the U.S. budget last time. And it really did eat up a lot of the resources and it continues to. But mm -hmm. I think the nice thing as an outside reader of this is there is a lot of balance between looking at these big projects, yeah. also preparing for the future. And from my side, it was nice to see theory well represented <laughs> and the frontier yeah. to snowmass. Yeah. Good. So everyone, everyone, uh, a little bit of stuff for everyone this time. So that's, that's excellent. So, so Sarah, something that comes through, um, and I, I don't understand this too well of, uh, because I don't understand exactly what's going on on stateside, but Something that seems to come through quite strongly in the report is that the U.S. budget for investment in particle physics is is quite limited or at least quite constrained. Is is that is that fair? Um, it would 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 we like it to be? Of of course, we would like it to be much bigger. But is is there a is there a feeling at the moment that it is quite constrained and could be could be loosened a little bit? I would say that in some ways we've been incredibly successful from the budget perspective. Since the previous P5, our budgets really have been growing significantly, or at least you know that there's been a, a nice um, a, a nice rate of increase um, that we didn't see a, a decade and a half ago. If you'd talked to us and asked us that question maybe 15 years ago, I think I, I would have had a really worried answer about declines in the field and you know concerns about being able to continue. I think at this point, it it's it's feeling constrained because we just have so many ideas. There are so yeah. many ways that we could imagine going after these different scientific questions that we are leaving excellent science okay. on the table. Yeah. So that that's part of the constraint. And um, yeah. So, so, so the so constraint is, is more that there's always more that you could do rather than you're not offering us enough to do the essential things, which is a good, really a good problem to have, I guess, in some ways. I, I think that's right. I think um, I, I think that we've tried to make the case strongly that different kinds of increases in investment could have 
really exciting returns. But at the same time, we have a really dynamic, broad, potentially balanced program, as as Patrick points out, um, under the budget scenarios that we've been given. What you mentioned the uh, the science and is it is it the Chips and Science Act? Is that something that's that's pumping more money in here as well? Because we constantly hear over here, you know, NASA should be funded more and various other things should be funded more. Is uh, you seem to be suggesting that that there is a little bit more focus coming into potentially into particle physics and fundamental research. Is that is that accurate? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's hard to say. The challenge that we have in the U.S. is our annual budget cycle where everything can be reset. Um, it's it's difficult when you're in the context of a field that needs some long term planning and has some some sustained um, you know budget needs for our projects that we've invested in um, to be in that situation where things can be reset annually. I think the Chips and Science Act is one example um, of a way that we could imagine having an infusion of money um, that, you know, some of that that goes to particle physics, but we're actually involved in a lot of things that are really relevant to national interests, like uh, investments in machine learning and AI, where we really benefited, um, you know, uh, supercomputers, high performance computing. I think there are a number of things that could come along that would see some potential bumps in our budget just because of the way that that we're assigned, you know, we're connected across different branches of science. Um, it's not clear what's going to happen with the Chips and Science Act, how much of that infusion we'll have. But like I said, given the this annual budget cycle, we're, we're not a very partisan science and, you know, we're not much of a political football <laughs> in the U.S. <laughs> and we also we also are so connected to areas of national national interest that yeah. I don't know. There's some real potential for us to see one of the more favorable budget scenarios, and and we're ready to spend that money wisely if it comes to us. Patrick, you 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 mentioned something to me on uh, on email yesterday, which was just just kind of alluded to there by uh, by Sarah the the idea that that this kind of P five process could be more frequent. Do you, do you maybe want to to mention something there because you you were talking about the budgets being reset? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess. Uh... The, the interesting thing about this P5 panel from the outside was like certain recommendations within it, like the collider panel that's going to kind of address where things are and react to outside trigger points, whether it be CERN with FCC or Japan or not explicitly mentioned in the report. But for anybody in collider physics, we all think about China's influence and CPC is about to have a technical design report go out. So, I mean, they're ready to go and we'll see what happens. So I think one of the things that's interesting about the P5 process from the outside um, is how fast we react as a community with this kind of resetting budget cycles as well as external influences. For instance, the last P5 report happened when we didn't really have the full landscape that we have now. Like new results from the LHC came in. Hypercommunicande was greenlit kind of halfway through the last cycle. We didn't know exactly how much it was going to end up costing. So it's interesting to see how this P5 panel definitely thought ahead with the collider aspect, with thinking of having this extra panel. But it's also interesting to see as we go forwards in the U.S. whether the cycle being shortened of five or seven years would be more optimal than 10 years or whatnot. So it'll be interesting to see how fast the DOE can react to this proposed set of research. Amanda, are there some, some trigger points where... We're kind of, um, I don't know how to, I think Patrick called it a, a P2.5 yesterday in his email to me, um, where some trigger points where that could come up. Um, Patrick mentioned, for example, China pushing ahead on, on certain projects which aren't necessarily mentioned in the report. Is there, is there uh, any so, idea for revisiting or, or having a, a follow-up, which is a, a little bit sooner than 10 years into the future? So I think this is certainly something we talked about substantially in the context of the Collider panel that Patrick mentioned. Mm -hmm. And I think the consensus of the panel was, no, we didn't really want to see a, a mini P5 or P2.5. The Collider panel has a very specific role that is designed to address a very specific set of questions mm -hmm. that we saw needing to be addressed before the start of the next cycle. Um, and that related uh, to the decisions about uh, a Higgs factory and uh, new information about from all of the feasibility studies of the different uh, potential 
implementations of such a Higgs factory. And it also related to some of the long-term collider R&D projects in terms of decisions about future demonstrator designs and evaluating which demonstrator designs we or test facilities we might want to pursue for the next decade. Mm. But we didn't want to reopen the whole box of the full global questions that P5 has to address on a shorter time scale. I think there really has to be a balance here. On the one hand, the US budget cycle is short. And obviously, in any 10 year period, new things are going to come into play that you didn't anticipate. Yeah. On the other, if you're going to execute on large big ticket projects, those require planning time. and yeah. thought, and you're not going to abandon those those arcs right. midway through. Yeah. You may adjust, but some of that adjustment is done at a level that is below P5 by yeah. the agencies and by the management of the projects. So I, I think it's very important to recognize that P5 can't and shouldn't do everything when it comes to those micro adjustments yeah. that happen within a 10 year period. More, uh, more of the high level ideas a, than the micro micro path micro to go micro. down. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Sarah, I wanted to, I hadn't, um, just when I was researching for, for doing the questions for this discussion, um, I came across this report. It was the, the HEPAP report on the, um, if I can find it, where is it? Uh, I've got it in here. It was a report on the, um, the US influence on the global stage in particle physics. And it seemed a little bit downbeat from the US side. Obviously, the US has a, a brilliant and celebrated past in, in particle physics research. Um, but this report seemed to be suggesting that, that, that some cracks were appearing in that, particularly people not looking at the U.S. as, as a kind of um, solid partner because of the, um, the changes in budget and potentially smaller budgets than uh, expected or, or changes in projects. Did you, were you looking at that report when you were building the, uh, the P5 offering or, or, or not so much? Uh, I, I think that, that we have some history in the field that... Um that people are aware of. I mean, if you go out after a conference and particle physics, um, drinking with a group that's been working in the field for a couple of decades, you may end up eventually talking about the canceled super collider in Texas, <laughs> yeah. right? I mean, there we do have a history if you go back where yeah. um, the US has made commitments and there's been a tremendous amount of work done and then we've, we've pivoted really quickly, mm -hmm. um, which has been a, a challenge for our international partners. And, and of course, for people who are, you know, depending on this in the US. So there, that's kind of looming in, in our background. Um, because of this funding model that we have, we're very agile, which is exciting, yeah. Yeah. but we, we have those risks. Um, and you know that it's such an interesting time in the field where we don't collectively want to build three large Hadron Colliders. We want to work together and um, collaborate effectively internationally. That means that we have to be able to trust each other, that we have to plan taking each other's interests into account. And I think what we want in the U.S. is strong participation yeah. where the science is happening offshore. That That's really interesting for us. So, you know, th th there are lots of examples of how we're doing that. But we also want to have the capabilities to host when it's our turn. Yeah. Um, right now, we're hosting one of those very high intensity frontier experiments, um, uh, the Dune experiment that, that you talked about. Um, we want that to be a success. There are interesting scientific questions there. We've invested money. Our, our international partners are counting on us. We want that to be a success. We want to have the, the ability in terms of the facilities, the infrastructure and the budgets to host other big projects in the future when, when it's our turn on that international stage. So I think that that's what the HEPAP report is looking at. How do we maintain the infrastructure? How do we maintain and in increase our, you know, do that R&D that we need, um, train people, all of that, um, so that we can participate when things are offshore at a strong level and, and have the capabilities to bring things back home. Um, and you've got a nice mix of that in the in the P five report, so that's uh, that's good. I think so. Yeah. So I want to I want to move into some of. So we talked a little bit about the kind of the setup of the report and the and the kind of politics behind it. I want to move into some of the specifics of the report because that's the the interesting science. So so Amanda, maybe if I come to you, what are the what are the major fundamental areas in which um, 
the P5 report was was seeking answers. So one one of the things that I noticed, and uh, I know this was mentioned by um, Hitoshi Murayama, the, the 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 chair, was that there's a really nice balance between the very small scale and uh, the very large scale. Was that was that intentional? Um, so, so I think that your question could be interpreted in multiple ways. I'm assuming here you're referring to physical scales of questions yes. rather than, than time scales or sizes of experiments, yes, yes. which was also a concern for us. F phys the, uh, the scale of the so, physics. So I think that there's a, a natural connection there when you consider that, right, that I think this is something the universe has told us rather than something I think we constructed out of whole cloth, that there are these natural connections between the very small and the very large. Because in the early history of the universe, you have this very small, hot, dense structure that then expanded very rapidly. And we now look at the inference of which mm -hmm. what were tiny quantum fluctuations, right? They started out as something tiny but they're now imprinted of, at a very large scale on the fabric of the universe. And I think that fact is one of the things that has motivated particle physics embracing cosmology yeah. at yeah. the scale that it's done over the last 10 years. Uh, but it's something that... And it's become, a, pre it's become a precision to... science as well over the... Over it's the become a decade. precision science. And this is something that happened naturally as we learned more. It's not something that we somehow invented to give a nice <laughs> symmetry to our work. It's something the universe provided mm. to us. Uh, that there's, you know, just as there's this natural fact that when you look at very high energies, you are naturally studying very small mm. scales. So these balances are something that are built into the fabric mm. of the science itself. It's something the universe tells us. Mm. Uh, but it's certainly something that we wanted to capitalize on yeah. And it's something that I think has motivated a broadening of the types of techniques and technologies that the field uses, right? That accelerators remain incredibly important to the field. And in fact, centering new accelerator technologies was something that we wanted to do. But you also now have this entire suite of telescopes and cosmological techniques that you can use to also mm -hmm. address these questions. And that's extremely exciting. The yeah. more tools we have, the more we can learn. Patrick, you, you mentioned not, not only is it a, an idea of tools as well, but when people are potentially getting down on, on you know, building a, a new collider that goes higher into the, into the energy frontier, this is a really nice story that you can capture people's imaginations with as well and sell the uh, the value of, of um, particle physics research, Patrick. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the nice thing about these stories that we can tell from the smallest to the largest distances really can kind of captivate the attention of people outside our field. And I mean, one of the interesting things going forward from this report is how do we take this report and all this great science and then go to Congress, explain it, and get these more favorable budget scenarios that we're hoping for. And because, because it's taxpayers' money at the end of the day, isn't it? And if you need to sell exactly. the story to, yeah. And I mean, I, I think that's why, for instance, for like the one project with the Muon Collider, it was interesting because you can kind of go in so many different directions in terms of telling stories about the early universe and the late universe, while also talking about new technologies and time dilation and right there in your face. And talking about national scale projects, as we said, like taking turns between like when it's our time and how it dovetails into the bigger picture. So there really are a lot of stories that you can tell around this that hopefully we'll be able to convey, convey well to Congress in the future months and in the future years. And hopefully we'll be able to realize this report. I always just feel like, and maybe this is unfair because I really enjoy doing, doing particle physics outreach stuff, that there's a, always a lot of interest in space and the and the and the huge scale of space. If you can tap into that coming from the other end, it's always a useful a useful story to tell, Patrick. Yeah, and I think that's the one thing also that this report recognized with theory, because when you look at like these great graphics that were designed for the P five report in terms of 
quantum fluctuations, invisible universe, directly probing things. I, I think the reason why we're able to tell these stories inherently is the underlying theoretical physics. For instance, we can take an experiment with a telescope in space. We can take a tank of material underground. We can take a collider. And the reason why we can weave a story together is we have this underlying theoretical model of the universe that relates these. And by supporting that, we're able to further tell these stories that hopefully captivate the imaginations of people outside of particle physics. And I think I think it's really important as well to have that that large scale stuff because because like I said, that there, there seems to be and we saw it yesterday, Elon Musk posting things and other people posting things about building larger and larger and larger colliders to go to the energy frontier. There are other ways to get there. The the future of the field doesn't necessarily rest on those. Patrick, just to just to close us close that out. Yeah, I mean we have so many different directions from experimental results that have massively changed our field. For instance, sometimes we think of particle physics as just colliders, yeah. Yeah. but within my lifetime, I mean, some of the major discoveries have been, for instance, neutrino mass, which wasn't a collider experiment, but it uses techniques from particle physics. I mean, discovering the accelerated expansion of the universe with supernova, I mean, this is particle physics, even though it's an entirely different yeah. thing. And learning how these weave together is really exciting. And that's what I think this report sets up for the future. Excellent. So I want to jump into some of the some of the projects that, that are being being funded to to let people kind of know, um, give them a feeling of, of, of some of the things that have been um, or, or are suggested to be supported by by P5. So, Sarah, maybe if I come to you first, that there's kind of. Um, the first thing that comes up is that there are there are kind of major projects which are are kind of already on the books from the previous P five that are that are still going to be supported. the The first one is the high luminosity LHC, and I think we saw just before Christmas some of the first magnets being being sent across there for the uh, for the upgrade. So, can you give us a a little bit of a flavour for people who aren't um, particularly aware of what's going on here? What is the high luminosity LHC, and why is this something that that P5 wants to continue to support. Right. The high luminosity LHC, actually it's the LHC is what I work on. So I'm super excited to talk about this. We've been planning for it for a long time. Uh, it is the energy frontier, as we call it. So the highest energy human collisions that that we're able to make um, and, and have these detectors surround. Um, there's something that's really exciting, even though, as Patrick pointed out, it's not the only way that we can learn about the physics we're interested in. There's something really exciting for me about smashing particles together at the highest energies that we can possibly manage, and then just asking nature, what can you make with this? It's as close to as an it's as close to an agnostic experiment that we really can design where we're just wide open in terms of discovery. Um, and so the, the idea is we want to go as high in energy as we can, and we want to take as much data as we can. Mm. The high luminosity LHC actually gives us a factor of 10 more data, an order of magnitude more data, um, and um, a little bit higher energy than what we've currently been able to probe. So if so, there's a rare process there, maybe potentially that will come out, whereas it might not have done if we if we stayed at a level below. Oh, absolutely. Right. A rare process, or we're just going to be able to go to such precision in terms of, you know, maybe we'll find something, a, a bump in our data that yeah. says, hey, I'm a new particle. Yeah. But maybe what will happen is we'll make measurements of stuff we've already measured and yeah. see little discrepancies yeah. and use that as a hint that yes. there's new physics. So we're, it's the whole suite of things. We're going to be looking for dark matter. We're going to be looking for um, new, more massive particles than we could see. We're going to be increasing the precision on the standard model measurements that we've already made um, and also, you know, taking advantage of some of the real revolutions that we've had, like um, in increased um, capabilities because of machine learning, better computing to be able to extract even more data, more information from the data than you'd get just thinking about how much data are you getting? How much energy do you have? It's incredibly important 
And it's going to be the next 15 years. Um, it's incredibly important for us to continue to work with data, um, understand how to better design future experiments based on what, what we can do with, with what's been created. I, th I think that's that's a really important thing that you mentioned is that, that people... I think there's kind of a canard that the only way you make kind of progress people see from outside the field is if we can go up higher, 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 higher. But sometimes it's actually doing precision measurements of things that you've already seen to find those little cracks. Maybe some of those cracks come together and you can realize where you need to look with a new experiment or, or potentially with a new theory, Patrick, if we if we uh, if we want to create something new. So I think that's a really nice, nice message. Is that fair? Sarah? Yeah. Yes, um, I think it's good that we have thousands of people on these experiments because you have all kinds of different personalities. There are some people who want to measure something to the fourteenth, you know, the fourteenth <laughs> decimal place, and and they will like they will cling to that and make and get it done, you know. And there are other people who kind of go out there with an axe and the most difficult to understand kinds of particles and are just kind of hunting through the jungle for new things. I mean, it, it, yeah, it, we have these really big teams that that all looks at this data set from from just hundreds of different thousands of different perspectives um and it's not clear at this point where the next discoveries are going to come so uh yeah the hllhc really represents a, a huge opportunity for us as a field amanda if i if i come to you the next one that that is um the project that's kind of already underway is is obviously june that we've that we've kind of mentioned do you, do you maybe want to outline briefly kind of what the what the idea is there and what the questions we're we're looking to answer are with june so yes, so I, I think it's been alluded to before Patrick mentioned neutrino mass, right? We've realized, you know, in recent decades, and it was something of a shock. Initially, the idea though was that the neutrinos were massless. Mm. And when we started doing measurements of neutrinos from uh, astronomical and astrophysical sources, we, um, including our own sun, we started to realize that something weird was going on and that neutrinos, in fact, when we were detecting neutrinos of what we call a particular flavor, because they come in these three flavors, uh, and all of our detection and production processes that we know of align with those flavors, we were seeing situations where we weren't seeing enough neutrinos of a particular type. And this was very puzzling and worrying. <laughs> And after a significant amount of effort, um, the explanation that emerged was that neutrinos, in fact, do have very tiny masses. And because of that, uh, because the mass states of the neutrinos are not the same thing as the flavor states, they are able, in a sense, to oscillate that if you produce a neutrino of a particular flavor, it's in fact this mixture of neutrinos of different mass. And as they travel, the nature of quantum mechanics tells you that then they evolve or, or oscillate uh, between these different flavor states. And so something that starts out as purely one flavor state at some later point in its journey will be a different flavor. Hmm. Obviously, once we understood that, that told us something, but it didn't tell us everything. It doesn't tell us the mechanism that gives the neutrinos their mass. It doesn't tell us what the neutrino masses are. Um, and it also doesn't tell us precisely what the parameters are that define the oscillation behavior. It doesn't tell us what the ordering of the neutrino masses are. That is, if we try to do this matching up of electron, muon, and tau neutrino admixtures, how did those line up with the specific mm -hmm. mass states? We don't know that. And there's two potential orderings that are in play. And so one of the earliest goals of DUNE is to measure that mass ordering mm -hmm. uh, to high significance, to high precision. Uh, but the broader goal of the total DUNE project, not just the first phase of DUNE, but also the complete phase of DUNE, is to do a more complete measurement of all of the parameters that govern neutrino mixing and neutrino oscillation. Mm -hmm. And also to measure this question of CP violation yeah. in the neutrino sector. It's very interesting to me as an old LHCB person is to, to get this answer to whether there's CP violation in, in the neutrino sector. I started my own career as a PhD student, <laughs> PhD student on Babar, ah, also doing go, the yeah. mixing. So, 
Yeah, for me too, it's very interesting mm -hmm. to be coming back to the question of CP violation, but in a completely different context with a different particle in a different system. Yeah, very, very, very interesting. So lots of open questions, the mass orderings, uh, potential CP violation, the absolute masses, which are being done with other experiments. There's still a lot to learn in the neutrino uh, science sector. The the final one that was that was kind of still being coming through from the previous was the um, from the previous P5 was the Vera C Rubin Observatory. I don't know who wants to to jump on that and give people a little bit of an idea of why this is still one of the the major projects um, which is being supported by P5. Anyone want to put their hand up and uh, take Vera C Rubin? That's a that's a that's a, that's a, that's a no I'll then. Make this right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Patrick, I, I, do you want to take that? Pat, or Patrick, one of us? come on, Patrick. I can't say why P five supported particular <laughs> things. So I mean, that that's up to you two. I, I mean, from going in the different direction than Dune and High Lumi LHC. I mean, both with uh, Ruben and then also with uh, CMBS four. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think there's a lot of interesting questions that you can't necessarily answer via terrestrial experiments or via energy frontier experiments and whether with these large surveys to understand dark energy better. And also, I mean, like one of the really exciting things about CMBS4, which was highly supported in the report, is if we have very light new particles, right, that might interact incredibly weakly with us, we can kind of target that on with terrestrial experiments. But at the same time, we also know if they have any coupling to the rest of us, they're produced cosmologically and they have cosmological impacts. Mm -hmm. For instance, like this N effective measurement, the number of light degrees of freedom. And this is a really exciting thing by supporting this direction of physics allows us to kind of, in as agnostic way as possible, ask these questions about are there very light particles but just very weakly coupled to the rest of us that we wouldn't see in other experiments or other sorts of telescopes. So the so the idea with this is yeah. is this massive deep survey of an enormous area of the sky, much more than we've we've done before, and also, I guess, over a long period of time to be able to try and get some of the the time evolution of of some of the objects that are out there. Is that is that fair, Amanda? So I I well I think you know LSST. Um, has a, the, the the survey that goes along with the Rubin Observatory, I think has a broad range of goals that extend well beyond particle physics. And so certainly time domain astronomy will be one of the things that it does. I think from the point of view of the particle physics goals, it's really the measurements that relate to cosmic evolution are very important. The influence of potential light species is on the, that certain phases of that evolution are important understanding the nature of what's driving cosmic acceleration is yeah. a big piece of that story in, in our current era. Um, and there are also issues like it will give us insight into and measurements that constrain the sum of the neutrino masses, yeah. which you can then confront against other measurements that are being made in the neutrino sector in both particle physics and nuclear physics. And I think it's really important to stress there that the sum is greater, the whole is greater than the sum of its yeah. parts in this situation, right? Being able to take these cosmic constraints that we will gain from experiments like the LSST and the Rubin Observatory and the constraints that we will gain from direct measurements of dark, direct searches for dark matter and work that's being done at the HLLHC and work that will be done by Dune all of these pieces when you put them together yeah. and you're able to confront cosmic constraints and direct particle physics measurements together uh, when we look for cracks when we look for these pr potential transformative realizations part of the reason i think balance was so important to us is partly that as sarah said we don't know where that next discovery will come from but also that having these multiple constraints yeah gives you a better chance of finding where those cracks are that give us you're, our you're next window. You're covering more of the parameter space to what the universe a better idea of what's, of what's going like. on. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but also, when you constrain things from more than one angle, when you're doing mm -hmm. these precision measurements, it potentially tells you more than one of these measurements could on its own. 
So we could find that there's tensions between the measurements that come from cosmic surveys uh, on the sum of the neutrino masses and what we will observe terrestrially. And that would be fascinating yeah. if that turned out to be true, because it would tell us that we're missing something. And that's exactly what we want to find. Shall we, Amanda, do you just want to, um, so that's the, that's the, the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. The, just while we're, while we're on that, because it's a kind of a similarly related um, issue, we have five, um, or is it five large projects with budgets over, is it over 250 million? Each were high, highlighted for support. Um, these are said to be potentially paradigm changing, uh, have paradigm changing discovery potential to be world leading and unique in the world. Five of these projects supported by P5. So I wanted to discuss those a little bit. And the first one that's kind of already been flagged up there was this CMB S4. So could you could you tell us a little bit about about what that project is and, and why it's important? So CMBS4 is what has been described as a next generation uh, cosmic microwave background experiment. So we talked before about the idea that fluctuations in the early universe um, in the process of that early stage of rapid expansion that we, we think happened, but we call inflation, uh, then get imprinted at large scale on the fabric of the universe. And it's imprinted as microwave, basically structure that we mm. see in the power spectrum of microwave radiation. Um, microwave, because over the evolution of the universe and over the expansion, the wavelength gets stretched and therefore it's at the microwave level. So those tiny fluctuations in the early universe now show up in structure in that cosmic microwave background that's that's hitting us from all directions. At large scales, mm. right, which is, is wild. So you want to go ahead then and measure that. And in particular, what people are looking to do is measure um, signatures in the polarization of the micro mm. that microwave background that uh, would help us constrain things like the energy scale of inflation. And so that is one of the two core goals. And the other core goal is also related to determining the abundance of light relic particles in the uni early universe which relates back to some of these questions that Patrick talked about before. Mm. Uh, uh, the sum of the neutrino masses is something that CMBS4 will also measure as part of its program. But those are the two primary goals that are on the books. And there's two pieces to this project. Uh, they use, um, so the, the part that's coming from particle physics, uh, the particle physics community has really contributed to the, the development of some of the technology and, and, and the cameras that are going to be used and the devices. Uh, but one of the things, there's two pieces to this project, one uh, that use similar technology, but they're in different locations. So one piece will operate at the South Pole and it's relying on the fact that this is, you know, a nice cold environment so that you're not mm. dealing with a lot of thermal noise that will make the exp the measurements difficult to do. Um, and then there's another piece that's in Chile, uh, which then surveys a much wider patch of sky and has somewhat different goals. But in order to really achieve the goals of the experiment, you need both pieces in play. And so I think that is the short ver description. We could get into a lot more details about how it works. Uh, so let me know if there's other things that you want to know. Maybe, but the, maybe these maybe these are the major time. scientific goals mm. of the experiment and the major constraints. So I think one of the big pieces is that it's using this amazing infrastructure, um, both logistical and scientific, that we already have at the South mm. Pole, which supports a wide range of science yes. topics that extend well beyond particle physics. Uh, and is just a really unique and special resource that the United States has. I, I was going to say something that came through in the report was was very much what uh, the U.S. wanting to keep kind of leadership and and the infrastructure there at the South Pole for doing these these amazing experiments came through quite strongly in the report. Um, is that fair, Amanda? I think that is very fair. Uh, this was something that we talked about quite a lot in our deliberations. Excellent. Uh, um, the third one in these in these large these five large um, 
uh, experiments. We talked about June already. Um, Sarah, maybe if I come to you, was a generation three dark matter experiment. So what's the idea there and, and what what kind of um, way forward do we do we expect to see? Yeah, dark matter is one of those topics that is really all hands on deck in particle physics. We've had um, searches for it in so many different contexts, but there are uh, some dedicated um, dark matter detectors um, that have gone through different stages, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, the generation three is uh, is linked to basically the size of the detector, very low backgrounds, extreme sensitivity, high volumes. And the idea is, you know, what is this over 20% of the matter <laughs> energy content of the universe? Where is it coming from? Yeah. Let's investigate uh, a wide swath of potential sources of this dark matter down to the point where we're going to be background limited yeah. from, from other processes. Yeah. Um, so there are a number of ideas on the table for this so-called generation three dark matter detectors. And we said, you know, the highest priority um, is to make sure that there's a, a generation three dark matter experiment that goes forward. We have opportunities to cite this in the U.S., which mm -hmm. means, we're, you know, it's a little bit more expensive because of infrastructure costs, but that citing it locally has benefits as well. Um, so that that made it on our top five, um, you know, on, on the top high priority items that we want to pursue. So, so the idea here would be presumably the assumption is that dark matter is made of made of particles. These particles are going to stream through this this low um, this low background detector, and there's going to be some form of interaction. And if we can get down to the level where neutrinos start to become the background, we know neutrinos interact very weakly. Maybe we can see some some types of new particles interacting. Is that is that a nice broad brush kind of idea of of, of what this experiment's looking for? You know, you could have asked yourself that question. That's brilliant. Yeah, that's a <laughs> yeah. I would say dark matter. I, I mean, I, I do some research. Yeah. You know, I try and keep on what's going. Dark matter has been such a mystery for us. I mean, we're looking for it at the Lar at the Large Hadron Collider. We're looking for it in tiny detectors. All you know, we're shining lights through walls in some cases, looking for dark matter. We've had to throw out that's a lot it. of our initial assumptions about where it's going to come from. But but this one, we really want to put some, we, we really want to get one of these things completed. Um, a wide swath of potential dark matter, you know, hypotheses we'll be able to really test. Um, and I, I yeah. guess once you've reached that kind of neutrino floor, you've kind of, you've really pushed in to, to most of the parameter space that, that you can do with one of those experiments, right? For I that mass about. range, exactly. Yeah. yeah, everything has access yeah. to different ranges in terms of the, what the dark matter, what the nature of the dark matter is, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, I think so. Please, Amanda. I, do you mind if I jump in and come? No, of course not. So Please I think do. with the, the G3DM experiment, right, um, as Sarah said, it can test you know, different hypotheses, but it does focus primarily around one specific hypothesis, which is still a strong contender, which is what we refer to as the weakly interacting massive particle or WIMP. The exact nature of that WIMP depends on your, your favorite theory. Yeah. But um, the idea is a, a particle of that type. Mm. Uh, and if I think people have started calling it more the neutrino fog than yeah. the neutrino floor yeah. with the idea that it's it, it's not quite as rigid it, as people thought, but it's where saying, you yeah. reach the neutrino background mm. and where you're... I think the idea is, you know, we really want to get to this ultimate sort of G3DM experiment, see what it tells us. Mm -hmm. And then certainly if you have reached the neutrino fog and you're still not seeing anything, you go back to the drawing board and you ask, what is the strategy for that? Yeah. And how that particular aspect of the dark matter search portfolio yeah. evolves. But as Sarah said, there's other types of experiments that we can do, many of which are, are small, some of which are even tabletop experiments that address other dark matter hypotheses. And many of those can be done quickly on shorter timescales, which is a nice balance in the program. Mm. And then there are also uh, astrophysical observatories that can indirectly probe dark matter by looking for certain signatures. and. Um, both uh, neutrino observatories and gamma ray observatories have a role mm. to play in the total dark matter portfolio. And so that was something that we talked as, uh, about as well, that we wanted to keep an indirect component to that portfolio. And it's another case where this broader, just as with uh, 
the Vera Rubin Observatory, mm -hmm. there's this synergy between a broader astrophysics program and the goals of particle physics and the two intersect. I, I think there's an intersection. I, I think uh, one of the projects that was mentioned was multi-messenger observatories with dark matter sensitivity, where, again, the South Pole comes up with, with Ice Cube there detecting neutrinos. Yes. So is that is that kind of linked in there as well? That is. So Ice Cube was the big size project that was a multi-messenger observatory. And multi-messenger is, is a code phrase that has gotten <laughs> fraction in the community that is an extension of what people say in the astrophysics community is multi-wavelength. The idea that if you observe the universe at many different wavelengths of light, you get windows onto very different physics that is happening in the cosmos. And when you put them together, again, this is a whole is more than the sum of its parts situation that you get a better picture of what's really going on. Um, Multi-messenger extends that and says, oh, we don't just use light anymore. We use neutrinos. We potentially use cosmic rays that there are, we use gravitational waves now that we have gravitational wave observatories. And so this is a, a sea change in how the astrophysics community and the particle astrophysics community views itself, mm -hmm. that you now have this full multi-messenger picture that pulls together the entire electromagnetic spectrum, yep. gravitational waves, neutrinos, the whole nine yards. Uh, so you have Ice Cube, which has particular strengths in probing certain areas of heavy dark matter candidates mm -hmm. um, and decaying dark matter. And then you have gamma ray observatories, and we highlight in the report one such observatory, which is the Cherenkov Telescope Array, mm -hmm. which is a smaller, more medium scale project that also uh, has real strengths for probing a very specific range of WIMP dark matter ma masses uh, and has a unique contribution to make as well. So trying to make sure we can get as much of that parameter space kind of looked into it as possible. Patrick, I need to bring you back because the, the, um, the last large project in there was the idea of producing a or at least supporting, excuse me, an offshore Higgs factory, whether that be uh, FCCEE at CERN, um, an international linear collider. Um, what's the idea behind a Higgs factory, Patrick? And why is this why is this so important going forwards? We've already got we can make Higgs at the uh, the LHC. Why do we need a Higgs a Higgs factory? I think it's a combination of two things where, I mean, we've already talked about how important precision can be for kind of finding where there are cracks in the standard model or where things show consistency. But it's also the fact that now that the LHC has found this last part of the standard model, and it really is the most crucial part of the standard model, right? I mean, it, it interacts with every single type of particle. It kind of dictates what the early universe, what the late universe looks like, the mass of all particles. And so it's really crucial that we go forwards and study the Higgs in a lot more detail. And the LHC is doing, has done great strides on this. The high luminosity LHC will do further. But because the Higgs is such a different particle than every other particle that we found, it requires a lot different types of technology and a lot more data to go after it than, for instance, the W and Z of the LEP days when we were doing precision after those were found at CERN in the early 80s. So it's a natural evolution based on what we found from the LHC and what we definitely have to go after to answer some of these questions. And it's also really important that it's its own separate project because we've talked a lot about how, for instance, for dark matter, you can search for it with um, gamma ray observatories, you can search with neutrino telescopes, you can search with direct detection. The Higgs is at this energy scale where it really is singular in the sense that you don't have as much data from cosmology that's going to help you understand the Higgs. We know the Higgs influences processes quantum imprints virtually, like the Higgs shows up in G minus two diagrams. But at the same time, we had to build the LHC, even though we had all these decimal places on G minus two. So the Higgs is this singular particle which dictates so much of the structure of our universe, but also is something that we need dedicated facilities to go after. We're just not gonna be able to go after it in these kind of other multi-messenger sorts of ways. 
So it's been the dream of the community for the last 10 plus years since the Higgs was found that we have a Higgs factory to go after this. Um, and we have a number of exciting options. Um, one of the things during Snowmass we kind of knew in the back of our heads was based on U.S. budgets, we're not probably going to have an onshore Higgs factory, which was reflected in what the P5 report came out, that it's not recommending an onshore Higgs factory first. But luckily, there are great options that CERN has a, a aspiration to continue its direction with this FCCEE as a Higgs factory. The ILC in Japan, it's been ready to go for a long time, but that would also be an extra wonderful Higgs factory that we could build on. And although, as Hitoshi said at the Fermi Lab Town Hall, that P5 really couldn't say it explicitly with CEPC because of political considerations of China, but there's another great option there in China that CEPC could go forwards as a Higgs factory. So we have a lot of great options, but it really needs this sort of dedicated facility to go after it. So is this all about creating, is this just a, a natural evolution of that discovery machine, precision machine, discovery machine, precision machine. So we go Hadron, Lepton, Hadron, Lepton. Is, is this just, we, we have discovered the Higgs now, we know where it is, we need to go after it with a, with, with a clean environment in a Lepton collider. Is this, is this the idea? That, that's the idea of where these Higgs factories came from. I mean, it's an amusing kind of set of terminology because we also know that the Higgs is so weird that just having more Higgses helps too. So for instance, <laughs> certain questions that the high luminosity LHC will be able to ask about the Higgs, these Higgs factories can't answer about the Higgs. But at the same time, by being able to do precision, there are certain things that the LHC will never be able to do that an E plus E minus collider could do or a muon collider could do. So it really is kind of this evolution, but it's also, you see the different options for Higgs factory projects, for instance, FCCEE versus ILC. FCC has this grand ambition to continue this process where you build a Higgs factory and then you can have the tunnel building like the next LHC or the FCCHH going forwards beyond that. So there's the dedicated idea of how you do the precision, but in all of these projects that people are thinking about now, it's also what are the facilities that could be built and then extended into the future much beyond the Higgs factory. Yeah, makes sense. What One thing you, you mentioned there, um, Patrick, was the the uh, the Chinese circular electron-positron collider. It's not mentioned at all, um, if I come to Sarah, not mentioned in the report at all. Um, suppose it does go ahead and uh, FCCEE or ILC is, is too late or it's not done. How will the the US community respond to that? In terms of the energy frontier, are you just gonna wait for a muon collider or any idea of, of how, how the US might respond to to that scenario? I know it's a little bit difficult with the, the politics with China. Yeah, yeah, and it's a big hypothetical. We don't we don't really know how far that project is gonna go. But I think regardless of that hypothetical, we're pretty certain given the current politics that there wouldn't be strong involvement um, if something does go forward like that in China. You know, the timing of that will be really critical in terms of how it impacts us. We have a lot to do through 2042 in terms of even taking data with the high luminosity LHC to see nothing of then continuing analyzing all of that data. We have a really robust accelerator R&D program that, that we're planning to make sure that we, we can make um, future energy frontier machines. Um, I think it's not clear how how Japan, how Europe would react if the Chinese were to go forward with that machine. I don't know that CERN would certainly would, would stop. I think CERN needs to have a flagship project that it hosts locally. So you could imagine uh, a push for a muon collider at CERN happening. I mean, there are lots of ways that I can see us reacting and, and moving forward. I can't imagine a scenario where we're waiting on our hands, though. I, I think, you know, we have plenty of data that's going to be coming in thanks to previous P5s and planning that's happened um, and lots of ways that, that we could react and have robust access to answering the, the scientific questions we care about. Fair we'll enough. see. It'll be interesting. <laughs> it's never it's never dull. Um, Amanda, one thing that came through in the report was um, this creation of, and you mentioned it uh, in your in, in your last uh, answer, 
this creation of kind of small projects or, or medium projects, this, um, is it Astai, A-S-T-A-E? Aste. Aste, Aste, sorry. Yeah. What's the, what is the thinking there? Is this, is this smaller projects to close off different areas of, uh, of parameter spaces? What, what's the idea with the Aste? Um, so I think Aste was actually, uh, a, a an idea that was very important to a lot of people on the panel. Uh, and it's there for multiple reasons. So small projects serve a number of crucial purposes. We were talking about the dark matter spectrum before, and particularly if you're going after dark matter candidates like axions um, mm. and other sort of DM portal type dark matter, there are candidates that you can test for with small experiments and we wanted to to make sure that that uh so you can already see that there's really exciting science that you can do with these very small projects yeah and these very small projects are agile they can be done quickly uh they allow us to react to new ideas in a way you can't with the large scale projects so we talked before about the fact that the big projects take a long time to design and build and yes you can adapt i mean Something like the LHC, something like Dune is very multi-purpose in terms of the type of science that you can do. And so people can get creative within that envelope. But there's something to be said also for being able to conceive and build and execute a small experiment that can answer an interesting science question. They also play a crucial role in developing and testing new technologies and as pathfinders for bigger experiments. And they're incredible training grounds. Mm. So we were talking before about our histories. I worked on Babar mm. and I was lucky because that was still the era where you could get in on the ground phase of an experiment mm. that was in its late design phase or commissioning and see it through to science, yeah. right? The early physics results. And that gives you an incredible experience because it gives you an overview of what it takes to get every phase of, an, of a big mm. experiment off the ground and execute on yeah. that. Yeah. Those opportunities are really few and far between now. And these small projects really provide them. They provide opportunities for leadership for junior people. Yeah. They provide opportunities for junior people to hands-on experience every phase of an experiment and take major roles in making it happen. And that was something that we felt was very valuable as well. Mm -hmm. So all of these aspects got folded into the design of the ASTE pro program, which is this portfolio is a departure from the way that the Department of Energy has historically done things because DOE is mission driven and tends to focus on the large projects. Uh, and I think uh, it was very important to us that we felt that this portfolio would play a major role in ensuring the balance of the field and the health of the field in terms of having this mm. agile small project component that was well protected. Yeah. And in fact, we, there had been historically in the last P5, a suite of dark matter, pro, dark matter projects that came about what's known, I believe, as the Dark Matter New Initiatives or DMNI. And so we, in fact, suggest that the DMNI initiatives form the seed of maybe the first slate of projects that's considered by ASTE. Very, very interesting. And it's nice to have that that, that wider, wider set of projects. Um, Sarah, I want to come to you. One of the one of the final things in the in these, these kind of big suggestions um, was an aggressive um, program of R&D potentially towards a 10 TV parton collider on US soil. Um, I know Patrick is going to get very excited about this and I'm going to bring him in uh, afterwards for the for the next question. Um, what's the idea there? Is this is this potentially future proofing um, particle physics research in the US? So that having a, a very long term idea of when it's your turn for the next energy frontier machine. What was the um, why was it deemed so important to um, consider the idea of the next energy jump being on on US soil there? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, the, a couple of parts to that question. One is why continue in terms of the energy frontier? Why do we want to keep going higher and higher and higher? Um, it's 
it's a line of inquiry that has been really important for us in the past. And we want to keep, we, we're stewards of that. That's a, an important part of our field that we want to make sure we can enable for the future. There's something really powerful about being able to smash things directly, produce <laughs> things directly in great number, investigate, run the experiment, rerun the experiment, um, that, you know, that, that we want to keep that in our toolbox in general as a field. And we have strong theoretical motivation for thinking that 10 TEV is an interesting place for us. It wouldn't surprise me if, um, you know, sorry, Elon Musk, we, we will be <laughs> thinking of higher energies in the future. So how are we going to do that? Um, there are ideas about accelerators on the moon. Do you just keep going bigger and bigger? No, I've, and I've bigger? seen, I've seen, yeah, right? J James Beecham's yeah. idea. Yeah, that's see, right. Yeah. That's right. Um, you know, in order to, to get to higher energies, you either need to dig bigger tunnels or you need to have lots of stronger magnets um, or, you know, you can have linear colliders that are longer and longer and longer. So we have good reasons to try to push on on better or different ways of accelerating particles. There are so many interesting ideas that could allow us to get those kinds of high accelerations on much smaller scales um, or do things less expensively so that you can maybe get higher energies without mm -hmm. continuing more on the same on the same technological paths. Um, the muon collider is a particularly intriguing idea for us to think about. I mean, it's it's really a crazy thing to go and work with a particle that lives like 10 to the minus six seconds, right? Because if we work with a particle, we have to accelerate it, we have to steer the beams, we have to, you know, make them the tiny, tiny beams that we smash into each other. Um, and when you have that little time, it, it just seems like it's, it's impossible to get that thing going close to the speed of light. But the fact that special relativity is working in our favor, if we get the particles going fast enough, quickly enough, um, we actually can extend their lifetimes in the lab. Um, the muon collider gives us that gorgeous fundamental particle that we're slamming into another particle, unlike that messy discovery machine <laughs> that, that um, is, you know, if you don't know what you're looking for um, or, or you, uh, yeah, there are benefits for Hadron Colliders, but the fundamental slamming fundamental particles together, um, it could happen on um, on the Fermilab site. Their yeah. ideas for doing this with three kilometer tunnels not 90 kilometer tunnels. So that's pretty interesting to think about pursuing. Um, and, and the US soil thing is important for us um, to make just to maintain that level of expertise so that we're strong, so that we can host. Um, you know, I say when it's our turn, I think that the entire worldwide community of particle physicists is just thinking about how do we pull together? How do we come together so that we can have um, different lines of inquiry. How do we continue these kinds of experiments moving forward? The U.S. is a is a big contributor to a lot of ongoing experiments, even that we don't host. We certainly don't want to lose the capability yep. of hosting Energy Frontier Machine in the future. Um, so yeah, one of the, our priorities was to put some resources into accelerator R and D. Yep. There are some targeted ideas there, you know, in terms of okay, let's let's see what that path is to a muon collider as as quickly as as we can. Um, there are other technology ideas, um, plasma, wake field yeah, plasma accelerators, yeah. C cubed copper that, you know, there are lots of other ideas people want to pursue that might plug in earlier or, or even later in terms of accelerator development to make things smaller, less expensive, more powerful. Um, and yeah, that, that's one of the priorities in the report to make sure that we develop in, in that area. I've, I've got to push slightly on, on muon collider. I've got my, you know, my t-shirt on and I know, uh. Patrick will be happy about that. Why was a, a muon collider seen as such a an attractive option for that for that ten TeV parton collider? Is it is it because and I know Patrick has done an awful lot of work in this with the with the muon collider forum report. Is it because of all those overlaps with the potential collider R and D, the the cooling potentially producing very very bright neutrino and muon beams? There's a lot of kind of steps along the way that are also useful to other projects. So so it makes it inherently attractive is that is that fair maybe amanda if i come to you because i can see you uh nodding away so that was certainly an aspect of it that you get these wonderful muon and neutrino beams to play with that you can do really interesting quantum imprints and precision physics with so that was exciting yeah. uh and unifying for the field, right? That there was an attractive idea about a project that fits on the Fermilab campus that yeah. would be a vision for the future of Fermilab, 
but which also meets the needs of multiple communities within yeah. particle physics. And too. within a shorter and time period meets... than the whole, the whole project. Exactly. Right. The idea of you're going to embark on this really challenging program of R&D and these intermediate demonstrators, the idea that those demonstrators not only do the R&D you need to do, but allow you to do really exciting yeah, science yeah. that benefits important scientific questions within the field. That's definitely a plus, And that was definitely an attractive feature that we talked about. Mm. And I think Sarah addressed a number of the other issues. It's a fundamental particle, it's a lepton. Yeah. So the interpretation of the results yeah. would be in some cases less complex because of that as well. I guess it's also really, the, the way I look at it naively as well is, is you've got that energy reach with the precision as well. So if people are gonna complain about, you know, keeping going on this cycle of hadron, lepton, hadron, you can say, okay, well, we need to do this precision work on the Higgs and other things. We can do that and we can also do an energy jump at the same time. So it's it's very attractive from a, a number of angles, Patrick, isn't it? Bring you in. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, to be quite honest, before SNOMAS started, I wasn't paying attention to the muon collider whatsoever. Um, around for the last five, uh, I mean, the muon collider idea has been out there since the late 60s. Um, it was which really I was taken... surprised about when I when, when I was looking into it. I thought this was a, a very new idea, but apparently not. I'm going to have to it start really... the uh, the tau collider. Uh, idea. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. and I think the funny thing was is like I mean, Leon Letterman, uh, one of my friends, found a uh, a, a a scientific uh, uh, conference proceedings where he said building like a ten TV on ten TV muon collider would be easy, and this was like in the seventies. <laughs> Um, obviously a lot of details had to go along there. I mean, people weren't even talking about cooling back in the late sixties when it first was talked about. Um, but then it kind of evolved. And then last P5, people were talking about the muon collider as a Higgs factory. And there was maybe one or two theorists, Talhan at Pittsburgh now, uh, was talking about it, but it was kind of this thing that hadn't really found its best application. It was harder to build a muon collider Higgs factory than an E plus E minus Higgs factory. The ILC could have been designed. And the last P5 killed off the muon collider in the US. But when I came into this, I wasn't interested in muons per se. As a theorist, I just want to answer certain questions. Mm. And for the Higgs, we already know the 10 TeV scale is important, right? I mean, it's not just a matter of just looking for exploration. We know we need this energy jump. And so when I came into this direction, it was like, hey, well, I'd, I'd support even this idea of collider in the sea, which is like this 500. <laughs> I, 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 have, I have seen that one. I've seen the, the one in the, um, is it in the Gulf of Mexico? I think I've exactly. seen it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so from that perspective, I was just interested in the physics aspect of this. But then what happened through Snowmass as I got involved with muon collider efforts was looking at these options for hadron, hadron, for plasma, for muon. It really was kind of at a statement where plasma is super exciting, but we weren't really ready to like make simulations. It's not at the level of a collider is going to be built in the next 20 years based on plasma technology. Hadron Hadron is great, but at the same time, we know it has to be gigantic, right? We have to keep building bigger and bigger and bigger. That's the reason why FCC is 91 <laughs> kilometers. I mean, it's not for the E plus E minus, you need 91 kilometers. And, but the time scale for that was also order 2090, 2070 to 2090. And it's mm -hmm. so far off that we're not going to be instantly answering these physics questions. And it was just kind of an accident of history where a number of things came together. And we realized that muon collider, at least on paper, was something that was realistic and everything was kind of order one away that we can do engineering on. And it allowed us to get this scale, which was, which was super exciting. And then it also comes in for the U.S. side of planning, yeah. where, as this picture behind me shows, it really is kind of like this love letter to Fermilab, where <laughs> all the stuff that we're doing at Fermilab right now with preparing for Dune, if we didn't have nice. something after Dune, we'd be spending a billion dollars building this proton driver, essentially, that didn't have a future. Whereas now, like the question that came up earlier on in terms of like having facilities that go on further and further in the future, 
It is a natural program that dovetails mm -hmm. with what's happening at Fermilab for the Dune experiment. And as you mentioned, and as Sarah and Amanda said, this is such a cool physics sort of project where you can take things from you on Collider and then you can apply it to understanding ice cube better. And then based on understanding better neutrino cross sections, you can do better multi-messenger astronomy with it. So it really is kind of this great future if we can bring it together, and which and is it, why and I'm- And so it's attractive for the, I know in the in the P5 process, there was a, there was a town hall specifically, um, Amanda mentioned it with uh, with young career researchers. So if you've got this, this exciting um, idea of the of the um, you know the the mid to long term reach of the field, potentially another uh, jump into the into the uh, the energy frontier as well. That's very attractive, Amanda. Yeah, I, I think also Sarah talked about stewardship and training and motivating new accelerator physicists is really important. Yeah. This is an area where the US has historically led. It's, a, you know, just as we, we've had a huge effort in building detectors, we've also had a huge effort in building accelerators. Mm. Maintaining and growing and developing that expertise and branching out into these new technologies that could potentially have a revolutionary impact on the field that's crucially important and it's not something you can put off for a rainy day because if you don't feed that expertise yeah. it yeah. dies yeah and so this was crucially important to us also that we have a vision for how this r d program would go forward that fueled and developed that expertise yeah. and this very rich and important resource that we have yeah it's very and, very important and drove it forward into a, a new era so as we we come to kind of summarize. Um, I mean, I don't think asking whether this is, you think this is a compelling program is a good question. Now, I think everyone does. Um, so I will ask the question, which aspect of the, the P5 physics program excites you personally the most? So we're going off the kind of physics now and we're going into, uh, you know, personal feeling about these, these things, I guess. Which, let's go to Sarah first. Which part of the, of the program excites you the most? So I, I have two answers and I'm cheating. I know sure, that's OK. We, we welcome that. <laughs> you said physics program, but um, I, I think this is physics. There is an emphasis on the P5 report on community engagement yep. and um, workforce training and accessibility yep. um, ethics in our research. I am really excited about the fact that this P5 took that side. It was part of our charge to think about diversity and equity and all of those um, really important aspects of our fields. Um, we need to broaden participation in our fields. Um, so I'm really excited about that aspect of, of the P5 program. Um, and then, oh gosh, yeah, I think um, the, <laughs> in terms the, of the, the romance, <laughs> you know, my, I did my PhD at Fermilab um, and I, I and I've been at CERN since 2006. I think that the stewardship of the U.S. program um, and, and making sure that we, we can be hosts of, of Energy Frontier programs in the future, I think that that's really exciting for me. It, maybe it's just because I'm influenced by the early career people around me who are bouncing up and down about it. Um, but, <laughs> I think that this, um, the fact that we can have such long-term visions together and and lay out a program that might get us to that place, that's really exciting for me. It has been really nice to see, um, you know, I, I've seen Patrick, other people on on Twitter who, who are in that kind of, you know, that HEP space who, who kind of interact, being really, really positive about this report. So that's really, really exciting to see. Um, let's go to you, Patrick. What's your... What's your favorite part of this report? I think do we do we even need to ask here? Yeah, is this? I mean, I, I think it's obvious from my background. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think having this vision though and stewardship is really important. I mean, one of the scary things talking to experimentalists in the U.S. is kind of this gap yeah. and, and what projects that young people can work on and sustaining our field. And there are a lot of there, there are a lot of people. I won't I won't bring any names up specifically. But they, there's a lot of people putting out the idea that kind of particle physics is on its last legs or, you know, we're not making any progress and we shouldn't be putting any money into new colliders and these kind of things, isn't there? So 
So there are problems with the maybe the optics of the field, Patrick, rather than the, the field itself. Yeah, I mean, we have all these really important questions that we want to answer. And we know in principle how to answer them, what we have to do to go after it. But we just have to have this will and the vision to realize them. And I think a lot of the field has kind of reacted to the way that when the Tevatron shut down, everybody kind of moved over to CERN that was doing collider physics. And we're I, I, of, I remember everyone turning up. I was like, this is, yeah. this is amazing. Like, where, where have all these people but come? It's great. As part of that, we also kind of are resting on our laurels and saying like, okay, CERN doesn't have this annual budget issue that we have. We'll just hopefully they'll have this vision. But when the vision becomes so long and when the vision requires more money that CERN can even do just on their budgets, we really put the whole field in jeopardy. Yeah. If the U.S. isn't willing to step up and say, hey, we're still excited about this science and we're willing to try to execute on a vision. So that's the, my most exciting thing. But I'm also really excited getting a second answer like Sarah <laughs> that, um, that theory was really recognized in this because I, I think the, the entire reason why you can have a P5 report and talk about why all these different aspects of particle physics are complementary and are giving you information that you can check against each other really comes down to theory. And whether it's the light dark matter where people only used to think about wimps and then theory exploded in the last 10, 15 years and gave you all these possibilities, or whether it's the ability to say like cosmological experiments and collider experiments and gamma ray observatories all are being able to test the same things, that all comes through theory. And so Theory has been suffering a lot in the last 10 years in the U.S. And by calling it out explicitly, um, that's one of the other really exciting points of this report for me. Excellent. Amanda, to close off this this question, I'll give you two or three answers or whatever you want. What, what yeah, you? so I, I think I, I realized, you know, when you asked this question, I have so much trouble picking. <laughs> so I think, you know, there's the obvious answer for, I think, each of us that we vote with our feet in terms of you each have science areas. I'm working in neutrinos and I also work in particle astrophysics that we find exciting. And in the near term, that's obviously where I've chosen to put my, my effort yeah. right now. But in a broader sense, I, I really do have trouble choosing because I think the science program of CMBS4 is going to be super exciting. I'm dying to see what comes out of the uh, Vera Rubin Observatory and LFST. I, so I have tremendous trouble choosing. Mm -hmm. I think I'm really excited about the entire Accelerator R&D program. Yeah. And I really want to see what comes out of the muon collider and plasma weak field. I really want to see what comes out of the new accelerator technologies. And I am also really excited about the ASTE program. I yeah. think it feel, fills a niche and a need yeah. that we have needed for a long time in the field. I work on small experiments as well as big ones like Dune. And I think they just bring a dimension to mm -hmm. the field that's incredibly important. So I'm really, really glad we did that. But I could have also given any of Patrick and Sarah's answers. <laughs> I think in, in the process of writing up the report for me, I think the single greatest benefit is how many different aspects of the field I got excited about all over again. Amazing. Right. I have one final question. Might be, uh, it's kind of, well, it obviously it's a scientific question, but maybe a difficult one to answer. So little bit of fortune telling. So if you had to guess, which part of the program do you think is most likely to, del to deliver a transformative breakthrough in our understanding of the universe? I'll go to you first, Sarah. Yeah, let me let me be a little <laughs> controversial here, but also Please. vote with my feet. Please. You know, that high luminosity LHC, we're going to have 10 times as much data um, and we have more energy. We're going to have better techniques. We have the potential to discover a new particle there that's lurking out at higher mass. So I'm just going to say, you know, what, what's most likely to happen? I have no idea. But that 
that potential is there. And it would be I'm nice excited. to find something there and quiet and down some some people, some naysayers, wouldn't <laughs> something it? Something else. I mean, people are so, what have you done for me lately, yeah, right? We did yeah. discover the Higgs boson and we've learned a lot about it. That was a big deal. But yeah, I, there's more to come out of the Hyluminosia. <laughs> I think, Patrick, you, you, you mentioned we probably... We probably should have sold the Higgs harder rather than talking about micro black holes and supersymmetry and things and said how amazing that is at the time. And then we maybe wouldn't have run into this problem. Patrick, you're on mute, by the way. There One last time. Um, I think uh, we really haven't explained well to the general public what the standard model of particle physics and lambda CDM for cosmology really implies about our universe. And the Higgs was kind of just like, hey, you found another particle. <laughs> you found the last particle, big whoop. <laughs> but at the same time, it really influences everything about our lives. The fact that we have atoms are due to the Higgs. The fact that we have a vacuum that we expand everything in physics around is due to the Higgs. So I think Studying the Higgs, whether it's the high luminosity LHC, a Higgs factory, a muon collider 10 TeV, that's my personal kind of guaranteed payoff direction because we know the Higgs is there and we can study it. Um, but I'm not going to be able to pick one as a theorist. Uh, I mean, I think <laughs> light sectors with N effective, that part of the CMBS4 program is really exciting. I mean, whether we get extra information from Dune about the mass ordering and CP violation, that then we can try to figure out, like, are neutrinos just kind of another boring fermion, or are they really completely different <laughs> than everything else we see in the standard model? So I can't pick one, but I think the Higgs is kind of the most guaranteed version of where we'd see transformative changes about our understanding of the universe. But this program is so great because we can touch so many different aspects of what could be there. I am very excited about the the, the CP violation in neutrinos. Um, Amanda, I'll come to you for uh, your final comment on that on that question. Where do you think some transformative change might come in this program? I know it's it's more fortune telling than anything, but just to to close things off. Yeah. Right? I think, you know, personally, I think part of the reason we needed balance in the program is because it's impossible to predict where that next transformative result will come from. If history has taught us anything, it's sometimes those transformative results don't come yeah. where you're respecting, where Definitely. expecting. Yeah. I think uh, the original neutrino results that pointed the direction towards what we have now with Dune started, I believe, with a proton decay experiment. Right, so we weren't looking for what we got. Mm -hmm. the The original discovery of the the charm quark in a bound state, um, people were trying to measure something completely different. Uh, no one expected when they started measuring the supernova distance scale stuff that they were going to wind up with oh, the expansion of the universe is accelerating. So I think. I tend to avoid this sort of fortune telling. <laughs> I um, tend not but, to ask it. I That's don't... why it's the last question on the on the sheet, right? Because it's <laughs> it's not really a scientific question. It's more a a paparazzi it's grabs not, you right? yeah, question. Exactly, but I, I do think that you know I I don't disagree that obviously when you push at accelerators, that the chances of surprises are there. And I also think that the interface between the cosmic experiments. So CMBS4, LSST, and what we will be measuring in Dune and at the LHC and HLHC, that interface has been a very, very fruitful place for new results and new ideas in re recent decades. And I think it's a good bet that something interesting will come out of it in the next 10 to 20 years as well. I think uh, so if I, I had to bet, those are, are good places to look. Excellent. I think that's a really nice place to leave it on on essentially reinforcing the um, the broad scope of this uh, this P5 um, report. And potentially we could find transformative things from many, many, many different places or even the uh, the combination of, of several places. So I'd like to thank you all very, very, very much for for taking the time today to discuss this with me. I've had an absolute blast. I've learned so much. It was absolutely fascinating. Um, I have a, a little section for um, if you would like to point people anywhere to learn more about the 
the P5 report? Is there is there anywhere you'd like to to flag up for people to read more and and, and learn more about what's going on with the with the program that's being supported? Uh, I'll come to Sarah for that. Yeah, I, I think, um, it, you know, the P5 report itself was written in a way to actually be pretty digestible. Yeah. We have a lot of acronyms, but there's a glossary. And if you read the, the first sections of it, the executive summary, I think we outline what our interesting mm -hmm. scientific questions are and what our strategy is. So, I mean, people shouldn't be afraid of just taking a look at the report itself. Um, there also were some nice write-ups of the report. We can give you links and, and some ones that picked up on different, you know, there was some press that was generated from the report, um, but we're making one pagers that we can try to send around. Um, yeah, I don't know if you, if you want links now. Well, or now is off. now is okay. If you send me them, I will make sure they're they're down in the description. There is, um, as Sarah mentions, a really nice digestible executive summary, which I got a lot of the questions from for for, for this discussion from. There's also um, a kind of. Uh, an executive summary, executive summary, a kind of two pager that which is very, very digestible with all the with all the main points on there as well. So it's not don't don't fear if you're not a, a particle physicist, you're not you're not a physicist. Don't fear having a look at this um, at this report because it is very digestible and uh, and gives you a really good idea of what's going on without going into, uh, you know, Feynman diagrams and, and Dirac matrices and all th kind of things that you might be a little bit scared of. So. So yes, I will make sure all of those links are down below as well. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, there's a very nice interactive version of the report that's on the website. I think that's, people can page through. And in addition to the executive summary, I think we worked pretty hard to make the introduction and chapter two, which yeah. has all of the recommendations as accessible as possible. So there's a lot of information and discussion in there as well. Uh, and for people who really are interested in all the details, the, the middle chapters deal with all of the different science drivers in detail. And I think delve into in a little bit more detail what you can get out of each of the science topics, how some of these things mm -hmm. intersect. So some of the points we've raised today are expanded on in those chapters in, in quite a bit of detail. Amazing. I will also make sure all of your um, your, your socials and your web pages are, are down in the description. I want to thank you again for for taking the time today. I really, really enjoyed it. I think people will really enjoy hearing about the uh, the path forward in the US and uh, and how that that links into fundamental research uh, around the world. So so thank you again. Um, have a lovely evening and hopefully the next time something something comes up, we can uh, we can get together and uh, and discuss more about fundamental particle physics. Thank you. Take yep. care. Absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Take, Take care. care. I want to know what you think, because you're the scholars of enlightenment that I do this for. So please take a moment, if you wish, to let me know down in the comment section. And if you like this video, please consider leaving a like, subscribing, setting up notifications, and sharing this video more widely. I can't tell you how much these simple actions help me out and how much I'd appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being scientific. Thanks for being bad.